violence that is happening there is dependent upon good public transportation. It's and and various forms of transportation. And so today it's really exciting for me because back in January, I had just a, a very quick run in with Congressman Mark VC, and he said, hey, Kelly, I want to talk about uh, transportation in Southeast and East Fort Worth. And I thought, oh, this is a perfect opportunity because we had just started talking about um, the BRT project with uh, Chad Edwards and William Johnson from Transportation Public Works. So we actually literally got to sit in a conference room with Congressman VC um, back in February, just before the um, just before COVID hit, and actually talked about BRT and really a part of his vision for B BRT. So you know, there was during the budget conversation, there was a big talk about. Uh, it going uh, BRT going from uh, the last station to the Ranger Station, whatever it's called these days, Globe Life Park. Um, but really, what Congressman VC said is really, I'd like to see it go all the way into Dallas, into my district, to literally run that entire gambit um, along East Lancaster as it makes very various iterations um, through across the Metroplex. And so, those are big high; those are high hopes. But we know that. Um, Eventually, it will happen, but I'm really, really excited that um, our little group Vision East Lancaster is is morphing into lots of different things along East Lancaster. So you'll also hear from Dan Hayes today as he talks about the East Lancaster PID that came online um, last last year. And so great things are happening, but um, I just simply say to all of you who are on this. Um, Webex today, um, please be a part of the conversation. There's the only question that is a bad question is the question that you did not ask. Um, and this is really a listening session. It is a learning session. It is a sharing session. Uh, I'm sure it is the first. It is the first of many. Um, but we need everybody to be engaged in this process as we move forward. I want to leave you with this note. This is not a tomorrow deal. This is not one of those things that's going to happen overnight. It is a process. Uh, we actually added BRT to our federal legislative um, list of, of issues that we wanted to push this next uh, legislative session. Um, so we are very serious in the city of Fort Worth about this project and we want to support it uh, in all the ways that we possibly can. And of course, there's some dollars um, that the city of Fort Worth will have to support, uh, add to this project to make it come to fruition. But I, I don't see that not happening. So I am, am going to quit talking and turn it over, turn it back. I just lost, I got like five different devices over here working. So forgive me, but uh, I'll give it back to Eric and he can lead us through um, the rest of the meeting. But again, thank you all for being here. And hey, Eric, if, if it's possible, because we can see people who's on here, but can we just kind of get a quick roll call of who's here so that everyone will know who's on this call? Uh, thank you, uh, Councilmember Gray, um, and thank you for participating in this and, and starting it off really on a great foot. There was a lot of uh, excellent information that you just provided, uh, some of which uh, might have been touched on uh, by me or others, but I think you've uh, you've addressed it quite well, and, and we probably don't need to do that. Uh, in terms of the list of folks that are on here, we have uh, we have at least 40, probably 50 different people. So it's a long list um, that, uh, that I think we could provide that uh, later um, rather than me reading each one as it goes through. But there are a lot of city staff. Uh, we have a lot of Trinity Metro staff in our representation. Uh, we have uh, Vision East Lancaster, as you've already noted, uh, on. Uh, and uh, representatives of the Public Improvement District for the East Lancaster Corridor are on board. A uh, variety of different uh, neighborhood folks and, and other leaders along the corridor. So we've got a great group going here. So uh, really happy to have everybody come together. This is, uh, this is really an excellent timing uh, opportunity. We've got so many things happening. Uh, Vision East Lancaster has done a, a quite a bit of work and is looking forward to changes. The, the Public Improvement District has just started. 
uh, and they're getting going with uh, with you know their goals. Um, we're happy to help them. The bus rapid transit project and the Transmarine Development Grant uh, for planning work um, is is kicking off, and you'll hear more about that in just a little bit. Uh, but just wanted to thank council members Kelly on Gray, uh, Gina Bivens, who will talk towards the end. She's actually in a meeting right at the moment and unable to join us at this point, but will later. And then, of course, uh, Ann Zeta is going to be speaking in just a few minutes. So um, we do have um, we do have a poll for you, uh, and that's what you're seeing on the screen. So we're going to test out the the, the technology here. Uh, and Ruth is going to pull that up. So this is a poll we'd like you to answer. Uh, just five questions or yes or no. Um, so just should take a few moments for everyone to run through this and indicate what your answers are. And again, if any of you are calling in and you want to participate in the poll, then you can text me at 817. 9946973 and we'll send you the survey. You depending upon when you text, you may not get it in time to do the first one, but you will definitely get it for the second one. It's 8179946973. And while you all are, are working on that, uh, I will share with you what we've got. Uh, uh, we have a professor from TCU, uh, Jan Ballard. She's uh, going to be active in the quarter. She's got a group of senior students uh, with graphic arts degrees sort of right on the horizon. Uh, they're actually going to be doing some work uh, creating graphic components for uh, at least a couple of locations on the corridor. I think they're most they're interested in historic Hanley. I think they're interested in the Oakland Corners, Urban Village as well. Both of those are Urban Village locations, um, and we've had some of their work done in Six Points Urban Village and in Evans and Rosedale Urban Village, and they've done some really excellent work. Very creative folks, and um, so so keep an eye out for that and opportunities. Um, they were invited to participate in this event just to listen in and perhaps the students might be able to get a flavor for what's going on in the corridor. Okay, Ruth, did you get some results for us? Oh, our yes, route I is, did. you did. I can you show them. Just one second. Okay, and you all should be seeing the results now. Is that right? Yes, we can see them. Uh, nobody believes in the Cowboys this year. Uh, looks like that's understandable. Um, so we have the majority of folks do not live in the East Lancaster Avenue area, but there are there are some that do. Um, currently riding transit, most do not. So there are a few that do, but a fairly small number. Uh, and then do you own property that fronts uh, East Lancaster? Uh, for the most part, no, but there, again, there, there are just a few that do. Uh, and then lastly, are you a member of the Public Improvement District? And of course, most folks on the call uh, are not if they don't own the property along there. Uh, so there are a few that do, but most do not. Okay, so uh, thank you, Ruth, for pulling that up. Um, good to know the technology works. Just a quick rundown, what you see in front of you here is the agenda for today's meeting. You've already had the instructions from Ruth and the welcome uh, and some great words from Councilmember Gray. Um, my name is Eric Flatiger. Uh, I'm with Planning and Data Analytics, and I'm just reviewing the, uh, the meeting overview piece. In just a moment, we're going to bring Carrie Grant, uh, uh, Graham Carey from uh, Carey BRT and a Trini Metro consultant on board to talk about bus rapid transit. Uh, and then Councilmember Zeta will talk a bit about BRT and TOD in Fort Worth and what that means for our city. Uh, Trans-oriented development will be next with uh, Trinity Metro, uh, Jeff Davis, and uh, Phil Dupler, giving some information there. Then we'll move on to Chad Edwards with Transportation Forward. 
uh, Vision East Lancaster overview. So Wanda Conlon, who's been very active in that organization for many years, will uh, share some information on that. Uh, we'll also hear a little bit from Dan Hass on the Public Improvement District. Um, I'll review some initial questions for the participants, uh, and then we'll uh, show you some maps and give you a little bit of an introduction to those, and we'll be providing those maps to you uh, later. Uh, I'll jump back in just for the next steps, and then Councilmember Bivens will uh, share some final words. So uh, with that done, then let's uh, go ahead and move on to, uh, to Graham. Thanks, Eric. Uh, everybody able to hear me a moment? Am I good? Thank you. Well, thank you so much for inviting me to this meeting. There's a few things I want to chat with you folks about this afternoon. Is One is the project, the Trinity Metro um, BRT project. Talk a bit about what BRT is. And then I thought what would probably be most informative for the group was to talk about how other BRT projects has incorporated uh, TOD um, economic development into their project. And hopefully this inform us of what we can do in this project. So at, at the moment, we just started a, a BRT project to basically upgrade the Route 89 spur that runs along East, East Lancaster Avenue. Um, this would the the idea is that this the spur is a very successful route. It's currently it's the highest uh, ridership route on um, for Trinity Metro. However, it's starting to get caught in traffic. It's being delayed, and Trinity Metro want to take it to the next level. And the the next level is BRT. Now, for those folks who who don't know what BRT is, basically BRT takes all those elements that you normally associate with a rail system like light rail and applies them to a bus. And that may seem a, a little strange, but uh, many of the metros that you normally associate with as rail systems are actually rubber tired. You think of the Mos Moscow Metro, the Paris Metro parts of it, Montreal Metro, are all rubber tired vehicles. So um, whether it's a rubber tired vehicle, a bus or a train, I don't know. Um, I, I think uh, we could sit here and debate that for a long time. So essentially what we do, BRT consists of really six main elements. And, and you can see lists of these in other documents and they all slice and dice them in different ways. But essentially the, the main element of a BRT system is the running ways. This has the most influence on the travel time, on reliability, and it is the key element of any transit system, particularly BRT. Um, all the other elements are, are very important, but the, this is the most difficult element to, to get off any corridor. And there's a number of ways in which you can incorporate the running ways into a BRT project. And you'll see some of those in the examples that I'll show you in a while. They have an enha enhanced stations. You know, typically a, a bus system, we put a pole in the ground with a flag on it. And we say, isn't this a wonderful environment that we expect people to stand and wait for a bus in? Um, um, we don't understand why people are upset with this. So um, now what we're trying to do is we try and make them significant pieces of architecture. Um, you know, that, that currently on the spur route, there are some nice stations out there, but we try to make them so that they're places that people would want to congregate to wait for service. They have amenities at these stations. They tell you when the next bus is going to come. You can buy your fare. You can sit down. You can, uh, you know, things that you, you want to do while you're waiting and, and try and make that trip more more enjoyable um you know i'm probably going to upset everybody who works for a transit company by saying that you know very few people ride transit because they love riding transit and basically you ride transit because it enables you to do something it enables you to go and visit your friends it enables you to go shopping to do all those things you know transit is I'd hate to say it, it's a chore. So we've got to try and make it 
as, as, as convenient as possible. So what we're trying to do is do all those things. We want to make sure that the vehicles look like it's, some, it's a special service. We're trying to move ourselves away from this idea of a bus, which, um, you know, the poor bus is much maligned as, as a mode of transportation. We want there to be high quality service. And by service, I mean the span of service, how frequent the service is, how easy it is to transfer so, so that people will use it. It's reliability. We look at the fare collection, how you pay your fare, make it easy for you to do that. Also to speed up the service. You're not waiting on the bus while there's five people trying to pay their fare past the driver and, and everybody's sort of fumbling for their change. And that you want people to get on and off quickly. And then lastly, we want it to seem like a product. Um, you know, as you would market a product, get some excitement over it, make people want to ride the service, show them how good it is, something different, not like it's some sort of public service or a, or a social service like that I have to use. This is something exciting. I can use it. So, um, thank you. So on to BRT and economic development. Now, I can't explain how many hours I've spent debating this with all kinds of folks. And normally, it tends to be my friends who are very much into rail and try and persuade me that BRT has no impact on economic development. That tends to be the, the approach that happens. Only rail influences economic development is the common wisdom. Unfortunately, it's incorrect, and uh, the part of the reason is that BRT covers such a wide range of alternatives. Um, there are agencies who paint their bus in some fancy uh, colors, and they call it BRT. At the other end of the extreme, there are agencies who have rebuilt streets from building face to building face, completely redone it. That's also BRT. So the issue we have whenever we get into this debate about whether BRT does impact economic development, TOD, everything else is, is what are we measuring it against? Um, example I like to give working on the Portland streetcar, we included every development that ever occurred in the city in our economic development uh, analysis. Now, is that correct? I I'm not going to sit here and debate it, but uh, you know it really depends how you measure things. So today I'm going to talk about three examples um, that that have done a good job with economic development and development of TOD along their routes. One is in Canada in the Toronto suburbs. The other is Cleveland, and the other is Eugene, and they have a range of costs in between them. Viva is at the top end. That was, that's a project of pro, uh, probably at the moment about $1.8 billion. So it's very high end BRT. Healthline in Cleveland is somewhere in the middle, about, th about $200 million for about nine miles. And then you've got Eugene, which was on the lower end, which was about $30 million. So if I could have the next slide, please, Ruth. So first of all, let me do it. Let's have a little bit of a geography lesson here. York region is in Ontario. And if you see at the bottom there, you've got Lake Ontario and you've got Toronto, the area of Toronto. Now, just above it in the green, there's an area called York region. And York region was, if you spoke to people in Toronto, they would say, even people in their 40s and 50s would say, when they were young, their parents used to take them on a car ride out into that area to buy their fresh fruit and vegetables. That was out in the country in those days. That was 20 miles outside of Toronto, and they would pack up and go there for the day. Now, things have changed drastically over the last uh, 15 years. Canada relaxed its immigration policies, and there's a lot of folks who've moved into uh, to Canada. And particularly this area has been a favorite destination for folks moving in from Asia. And 
They, they are, you don't need much to move into Canada. And they found this area as a perfectly positioned and priced area. And so the developers have got wind of this and they started developing houses. And Ruth, if you could show me the next slide, please. Now, this is just a snapshot of what the developers are putting up. And they're putting them up everywhere. And these aren't little tiny homes. They've got full size basements and they're built for extended families and they're just covering the whole area. So York Region obviously got very concerned about this, that all their farmlands being taken away. There was no central town or anything to go by. So they decided to look at a way of trying to create a downtown and including a transit system in that. Next slide, Ruth. So they developed this network of, of BRT, which at the bottom connects into Toronto. So it's about 30 miles long. Next slide, Ruth. And in it, they planned this town centre called Markham. And on the left hand side, you can see how it was planned. And then there's a photograph that was taken in about, about four years later of how they're building it. So it's really taking shape. And a big part of it through the middle. Uh, left hand side, you see your typical architect sketch, you know, no utilities, anything like that looks perfect. But on the right hand side, you can see how it really looks. And uh, under three, three feet of snow, obviously, uh, which it is most of the year. But that's how it's coming out. You can get an idea of how the development along this BRT line is been happening here. And this is part of their town centre. Next slide, Ruth, please. This is also through that area. And this is on Highway 7. Now, I want to give a bit of a story to this route. This Highway 7 used to be called what the the, the Queen's Highway. It was the only highway that ran from one side of the country to the other, all the way from Vancouver to uh, you know King George Island. And this was the major highway through the centre of the country. And what the, we did with this project, we put BRT down the middle of this old highway. We had to widen it out by 20 meters on either side. So that's 60 feet on either side. And we went to these farmers and said, we want to develop this project and we will give you additional rights to develop retail and housing along the way. And suddenly all this stuff sprung up uh, along the way there. You can see those, those were farm stalls not so long ago. So how did we make it happen up there? We enacted new land use policies. We went out and we actually sowed development rights. And um, what we did, the planners that worked for me went out there and talked to the property owners. And they said, what's it going to take for you to develop what we need for our project? And we, we were able to negotiate with them and enable the, their projects to seamlessly fit in with the transit. So that was an important uh, part of that project. Next slide, Ru. So now I want to talk about the health line, which I had very little involvement in this project. This is in Cleveland. It's a nine mile line that basically separates the north and south side of um, Cleveland, along Euclid Avenue for folks who know Cleveland at all. Next slide, Ruth. And they divided the corridor up into a number of sections. It's nine miles long and four and a half miles of it are dedicated BRT with some with 36 stations along the way. Next slide, please. The first part that they developed was a midtown zone and where they, they went in and upscaled everything and uh, Next slide, Ruth. Just going to whip through these a moment. Gives you all the details. This is another section of the corridor through the university part where they had over 300 million de in development. This is in a four year period, by the way. Next slide. This is through the hospital region of the part. Um, 
another 190 develop, uh, million in development. And it continues on and on like this. So this argument that BRT doesn't spur development is, is a bit of a fallacy. And also I should mention with Cleveland, they wanted a rail system badly. For 25 years, they pursued light rail and couldn't make it pencil out. So they had to go to BRT as their only option. And it still spurred all this stuff. Ruth, the next slide is a couple of others before I finish off on this section. In general, this is the activity that occurred. It opened in 2007. There was $5 billion of investment and 13 .5 million of, of building and renovation, nearly 7,000 development units along this project. Next slide, please, Ruth. Just some visuals are going to, if we can whip through these, this shows what it was like before. This is how they planned it in the sketch, and that's how it ended up. Same sort of thing on this one. I ended up with BRT in the middle, and then again with the BRT going through the middle. And then lastly, I'd like to finish off her, to talk about the MX in Eugene. This is a very low cost system, a three mile corridor. And on this, they looked at a, very, a whole bunch of different operating arrangements throughout this corridor. Next slide, Ruth. So this is one section of the corridor, and I want to point out the alignment that's running from left to right. This is what they call Franklin Boulevard, and it's the only median, tree-line median in Eugene. And uh, this slide actually shows the BRT system running through there. You can see it's snaking above that big white lump in the middle there, through the middle of the street. It's the center running BRT. Next slide, Ruth. And the, the BRT is in the, on the right-hand side of the slide. You'll notice the grass in the middle between the lanes. That's, the buses straddle this grass strip. And the idea of the grass strip is that it's a drainage. It's actually a drain. And it also helped the community because they didn't want to lose their median. They liked the grass. They, they felt put more asphalt down was going to be bad. So they ended up uh, going for this design I put together where we left the grass in the middle and built two tracks. Along the way, there was all these developments. The university who had basically turned their back on Franklin Boulevard suddenly started opening up. And you see all these new developments that have occurred along this right of way. And now students want to be out there. They want to use the BRT. It's fast. It's and gets them to school. And now the university is supporting all those, all those students coming from that direction. So I think that's the last slide, Ruth. Is that the last one on my list I included? Yes. So I just wanted to give a bit of an overview of some of the things on BRT. I'm happy to take questions or leave them to the end. Um, and if you have any other things that you'd like to ask me, I'd, I'd love to engage you on this stuff. So thanks, Eric, for the time today. Thank you, Graham. That was uh, that was a great um, great summary, and I'm sure that we'll get some some questions along the route. Uh, I don't see any right at the moment, but I think that um, the more people digest as we move through the different discussions, the more questions might be popping up along the way. But we'll get back to you if um, if we have some for you. I think uh, we're moving on now to Councilmember Ann Zeta. Good afternoon, everyone. I want to first thank uh, Council Members Gina Bivens and Kelly Allen Gray for including me in this, because as you can see, the actual physical area that is part of this project that is in the district that I represent is very, very small. But I think that I was invited partially for that little small piece that I have that's attached to the route that we're discussing and for my overall huge advocacy for transit. I guess if you talk about transit enough, you get invited to all of the transit meetings. Um, and I would say I'm one of those people that rides transit because I like it, <laughs> not because I have to. So I, I work very hard at trying to encourage other people to do so as well. 
Um, in looking at this proposal for Fort Worth, I'm very excited about it because the East Lancaster um, BRT will be the first BRT in the whole region, not just in Fort Worth. I mean, Dallas, as much as they have in their public transit system, does not have any BRT. And so we will, with um, our partnership with Trinity Metro, have the first BRT in the region. Um, and I know that we've talked a lot about what BRT is, and I think it is very similar to the spur that exists. And somebody touched on the fact that the spur is starting to get hung up um, in traffic and congestion, which is, is affecting um, reliability on a transit system across our entire city. So prioritizing transit and doing it in this way, which is a substantial prioritization of transit, is something that we're looking at doing across the entire city, um, looking at all of our streets and finding ways that can help the transit do a better job so that it can be more reliable. But improving that route system is part of kind of the better connection that Trinity Metro is looking at right now. They've been doing a study of the entire system and trying to figure out routes and how to do those routes and how to connect them to each other and what is the type of system that people would be using more and will get more people to the places that they want to be on a more frequent uh, way. So we've had um, a lot of discussion about, <clears throat> excuse me, the future of transit. And I think a lot of it, rely it's coming to the point where people are going to other cities and seeing the availability of such resources in other communities, and then wishing that they had those same resources in our city. So I think that more and more we are embracing transit in Fort Worth, although it's a, it's a newer concept for us, um, but that is something that definitely is going to be needed in order to be successful with these improvements that we're making. The city alongside the Transit Authority with Trinity Metro are trying to kind of steer a very large ship into a new direction. Um, and we hear a lot from folks that are in favor of this, but when it comes time to actually implement projects, we tend to hear from people who maybe are not so in favor of it or who have some concerns about change and all of that. So I think it's really important to get people as educated and informed, informed as we possibly can about these things, how these things will benefit them, even if they're not daily users of it. So that, that discussion about whether it's an economic development driver um, is an important part of that aspect if it's not something that you'll be using. How it is a resource to get people to jobs and to, um, to school so that we're improving the quality of life for the entire city. Um, and then touching briefly on um, TOD, the Transit-Oriented Development, which I know another speaker is going to go into a lot more detail and I don't want to steal any of their thunder, but the planner in me is always looking at that side of things as well. Um, but transit-oriented development really brings kind of a mix of development, and I know some of the pictures you saw just in that last presentation, some of it seems very large, and sometimes that's a concern for people, but it can be mixed use that blends into an area and is reflective of the area that it is um, and sensitive to um, the area that it is being located in, but that mixed use development brings things close by your neighborhood and where you live, where you can walk and, and ride bikes and take public transit to those resources and not have to get into your car for every single trip. And those types of developments also bring a diversity of housing types so that more employment, more entertainment, and more places for people to choose to live can all occur. And those are all enhanced by their proximity to transit. Um, usually we, um, and then the, the final thing that is good about doing that type of development in an area like the East Lancaster corridor is that we're in an area where services already exist. So we're not developing something out in the hinterlands where we don't already have close access to police and fire and community centers and all of that sort of thing. So the economic return on the type of development that can happen in a transit corridor in the urban core um, is much more beneficial overall to the to the people that access it and to the city as a whole through the improvements that it brings and the economic development that it brings and the um, economic drivers of sales tax and that sort of thing, which helps us fund all of the things that citizens of Fort Worth would like us to have to increase the quality of life. So those were just the things I wanted to touch on briefly. Um, I appreciate being included in this and I'm always um, here to be a champion for transit and improving the quality of life in Fort Worth and happy to be a partner alongside all the other people on this call. Eric, there was a couple of questions. Do you want to take them now or do you want to wait? For me? I think just in general over. Okay. 
look, uh, I think we can take we can take a couple real quick. I think one was just answered um, by Corey Beck related to the map itself. Um, so we have one question from Mike Weiss related to um, to BRT, I believe. Do we have an actual text of that question? Yes, um, there's a few um, one from Flora. Unfortunately, we don't have a university or hospital district along East Lancaster. What is there along East Lancaster to anchor development? So, um, well, I'll just I'll jump in and other others can do so as well. I think that that um, that floor makes a good point that um, that we have a long stretch of East Lancaster that is sparsely developed and uh, a lot of the uses in that area are very uh, automobile oriented with you know fairly large parking lots and uh, it let you know not really a, a location where we have significant destinations um, so that does create a challenge on the on the, obviously on the, the west side we've got downtown which uh, is a very significant anchor on the east end we've got uh, historic Hanley urban village uh, which has some uh, character of its own uh, and then of course if the if the line were to be extended to Arlington and perhaps beyond in the future, uh, then then there are a number of different destinations that might come along the way. Uh, but noted, uh, there is a lot of redevelopment opportunity. There's a lot of uh, opportunity to create uh, character destinations. Uh, we do have a couple of urban villages in addition to the one that um, that I think. Um, I think she knows very well, which is the near east side urban village. Um, so I uh, hope that's helpful. Hey, Eric, can I can I jump in? So I'm not quite sure why we feel like um, East Lancaster is sparsely developed because it really is not sparsely developed. It is literally seven miles, a seven mile corridor of development. And because it was a state highway, you're absolutely right. It does have um, a lot of automobile uses that are there, um, but that is rapidly changing. And there are so many small businesses that are along East Lancaster that are doing very well um, in that corridor. It's also where the uh, Reby Carey Library is uh, under construction now. So with that thought in mind, there's so many things that's actually happening right there um, in East Fort Worth. And then you have to remember that um, Texas Wesleyan is literally a rock's throw um, away from East Lancaster. And it makes much better sense for it to be along East Lancaster than it ever would be for it to be along East Rosedale because East Rosedale has been completely redeveloped and that was, you know, a 35 year project um, that's in the making. I think if you if you take the time to drive down East Lancaster from 35, literally all the way to Han to Hanley, you would be surprised at the number of different types of businesses that are there. Um, that are doing very well along the corridor and people in the community are using those um, businesses. Uh, and then additionally, want to put this out there, you know, uh, Meadowbrook and West Meadowbrook and Central Meadowbrook and, um, and uh, Brentwood Hills and, and all of those little neighborhoods that are tucked along the way are really a lot is uh, they're becoming the new homes to people who lived uh, just west of 35 that could really no longer afford to live west of 35. And so the neighborhood is rapidly changing uh, with, with young families who are coming, uh, lots of little pop-up businesses that are showing up, you know, every single day of the week, uh, coffee folk and Nana's kitchen and all of those places that are there. So please don't discount East Lancaster because what you see is just what you see. There's a lot of great things that's happening there. Those are excellent comments. Thank you, council member. That's, uh, that, that is a good summary of the circumstance. Uh, there are changes that are already beginning to take place. Uh, Texas Wesleyan is a is a tremendous anchor along the way. Um, I think that it looks like we've got 
most of the questions answered at this point. Um, why don't we jump on so we don't lose too much time at, uh, to the next speaker, and that would be uh, Jeff Davis, the board chair of Attorney Metro, and he's going to kick off a discussion uh, that will be finished up by um, by Phil Dupler uh, related to the Transoriented Development Planning Grant and the project uh, that will be moving forward with it. So, Jeff, are you ready to go? Yeah. Um... Have a few minutes to give an overview of the project. Uh, it's a mile project. With 15 um, stations uh, along the median, um, we have queue jumps, transit signal priority, 15 minute headways, 10 BRT vehicles, bicycle facilities, fiber optics. These are all uh, going to be um, part of what is clumsily called densification. I think to answer. Um, what? Activities. And that's what you. And I need to mention Edwards has done in spearheading this initiative. I can say from my view, without Chad, we wouldn't be have, having this discussion at all. To put all of this in context, um, in terms of economic development, you, you, all of these projects are, are expensive. This particular project, the seven miles, will be about $160 million, uh, 80 million from new starts, from TxDOT through the RTC, 30 to 40 million from the city of Fort Worth if they can um, um, fund a bond election. So this is a pretty expensive uh, project, uh, totaling roughly $160 million. And if we're fortunate enough to be able to, I alluded to earlier, uh, we can continue this. Another not to the entertainment district, uh, for the city of Arlington, which would be, I think, historic and something that everyone uh, could be proud of. And that's another $70 million. So putting co cost and context is often difficult, but you must understand for every $4 spent on uh, transit, you get a $4 return. And APT has come out talking about for every billion spent, you get 15 to 20,000 jobs in return. Uh, Dallas Star has uh, two projects over a bit. Smallest project that DART is undertaking currently is 130 million, which is joining the McKinney streetcar line uh, with the Bishop Art streetcar line. I DART and the city discovered that when you put down fixed guideway, you get results. And studies with uh, North Texas, which talk about the $15 billion in economic development that has occurred that would not have for very operating currently. Um, what we need to think about corridor, and I, I don't know that it's properly been mentioned, but I know it will. Um, we have to take um, full advantage of this as a tool for the whole, this, this particular community prosper uh, and still maintain And we don't need to be taking so the plan must be community-based and provide the neighborhoods which with much needed social services such as the library and really create an inviting urban design uh, that can create uh, street life uh, uh, so that everybody wins. So in this regard, uh, we need to see uh, the metro, uh, the private sector, uh, everyone together to talk about how we can do these kinds of, of densification uh, structures and get everybody to win and the displacement that, that can occur without proper planning. So with that, I, I think I'll go over to Yes, thank you. I'm Phil Dupler, the Director of Planning for Trinity Metro. And I'm gonna 
explain a little bit about our uh, Lancaster Avenue Transit Oriented Development Plan and uh, give you a little bit of background on about the grant and tell you how we're going to move forward with the uh, with executing this plan. Next slide, please. So we've already heard that the uh, transit-oriented development is a pedestrian-friendly mixed-use communities centered around public transit infrastructure, and this is important. The benefits of these are one: neighborhood revitalization. We get increased local activity around transit stations, and that leads to more profits for local businesses, increased walking in the neighborhoods, and transit connections lead to more reduced traffic congestion and better pedestrian safety and air quality. And to get there, we have several requirements. We've got to have a local or a logical high frequency transit system and uh, continuous and connected sidewalks in the areas. We've got to have population density. That doesn't necessarily mean high rise apartments, uh, but typically a mix of different housing types that raises the average higher than single family uh, houses alone. We've got to have a mix of community sort of supportive businesses uh, like restaurants, coffee shops, hair salons, grocery stores, etc. Uh, we've got to have buildings that are not too short, not too tall, uh, that are up close to the street with street trees and street furniture. And this kind of makes people comfortable to walk in the area and uh, with parking uh, typically relegated to the back of the store. And of course, it can't happen uh, without uh, investment. And so we need a plan to guide that investment. Next slide. Next slide, please. So uh, our project proposal, excuse me, did we, we skipped the slide, I'm sorry. My screen was a little slow. So, uh, um, Thank, luckily, um, the uh, Federal Transit Administration offers uh, grants that we're able to tap into specifically for uh, planning for transit-oriented development. Uh, first authorized under the Moving Ahead for Progress in the 21st Century Act uh, and amended under the Fixing America's Surface Transportation Act, these uh, offered specific TOD planning uh, grants and goals. So we submitted an application in the last round uh, back in uh, uh, November of last year. And uh, just this last June, uh, the FTA announced $23 million in total awards for 23 projects across the nation. And our local uh, area brought back uh, actually uh, uh, we did pretty well. We brought back uh, a, a Dallas Area Rapid Transit is uh, going to have one a grant for uh, along the D2 subway project. Uh, Denton County Transportation Authority is having uh, a grant for TOD planning along their Adrian corridor, and we got a grant for TOD planning along East Lancaster. Next slide. So as we committed to the FTA, we will complete a comprehensive uh, transit-oriented development plan for East Lancaster with BRT as the central focus. Uh, the goals align with those MAP 21 and FAST Act goals and include enhancing economic development, facilitating the connectivity between the BRT and other modes of uh, transport, such as bike share and bike lanes improving the sidewalk infrastructure to increase access to the BRT stations, enabling mixed-use development, identifying other trans 
other infrastructure needs uh, that the city may need to invest in, like stormwater improvements, and encouraging private sector investment. Next slide. Our specific deliverables in this plan will include an inventory of the existing conditions, what is out there now, and an assessment of what level of transit-oriented development can be supported, a review of the existing development regulations like zoning ordinances and how those would impact the TOD, uh, multimodal connectivity plans uh, will be conceptual maps that lay out where various transportation assets should be deployed along the corridor. Next slide. Uh, we'll also develop a strategy for funding all of the necessary infrastructure. So much of these plans will be based upon the recommended BEX practices that have been successful in other communities with BRT, like the ones that Graham talked about earlier. And of course, it wouldn't be complete without station area concept plans. And that's where it really gets fun when we get to see graphics and renderings showing what development could look like around each station location. And lastly, we'll have a phased implementation plan because we know it will be expensive and it can never be all done all at once. Next slide. So our, uh, we will be seeking proposals next month for uh, planning experts uh, with particular expertise in transit-oriented development and experience in BRT in particular. We expect to select a consultant this fall, a consultant that will then develop a public participation plan. But we'd expect multiple rounds of public input throughout the next year, and with a final plan ready to be submitted to the FTA by the end of next year. So today is really only kind of a taste of what's coming. And we hope that everyone will uh, come and, and participate in the various uh, opportunities that we have for public participation. And I've put my contact information on the screen there. If uh, you have any questions along this, as we go through this project, we'll be happy to, to uh, answer. And that's uh, that's the end of my uh, presentation. Okay, thank you, Phil. Uh, that was useful information. Um, now we're going to move on to Chad Edwards uh, to share more information about transportation. Yeah, good afternoon, and thanks for having me this afternoon. This is uh, a lot of great information, and and as I'm sitting back, I'm realizing that I've been part of this project in one shape or form for several months to a year now, and that many of you may be hearing about all these different pieces of a BRT project, um, maybe for the first time. And so uh, it's important to realize that as a BRT project, there's a lot that goes into it. And Phil talked about the the planning for the transit-oriented development part that benefits the the BRT as the the people moving part of that system, and then Trinity Metro uh, and Jeff Davis talked about the 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 people moving part of that, and Carrie uh, Graham Carrie talked about the the technical part of that. So there's lots of different pieces. That's that's very similar to what I have to deal with on a regional scale, lots of different pieces. And so uh, where we're the 13th largest city in the, the nation uh, at Fort Worth, um, we're in you know the, the third or fourth largest metropolitan region in the nation. And so there's lots of stuff going on here in Fort Worth. And so if you go to the next slide, um, big picture, Big ideas that come out of the region. Um, what are those supporting accomplishments that we have locally? And I'll hit on those very quickly. And then uh, what I call is a good start is really the, the next steps and future projects that as a planner, we really have to think about, about how we improve and grow this overall system. So if you go to the next slide, So, so regional connections, if you're not familiar with the North Central Texas Council of Governments, 
also NCTCOG. Um, you need to, to be aware of that particular planning group. It plans for, and you can see on the map there, 12 counties here in North Texas. And I just pulled this snapshot out of their long range transportation plan, which is called the Metropolitan Transportation Plan, uh, Mobility 2045. And it outlines transportation investment in the region for the next 25 years. I have a sample of the, the major rail transit corridors that they've identified. They have another 15 maps that show uh, roadway improvements, um, arterial street improvements, bicycle improvements, managed lane improvements, all those types of things. And uh, so the, the planners at the region think big and think about how to connect across the region as what we're trying to do with this first step with the BRT um, project. And I saw a couple of questions that were asking about uh, connection into Arlington. And that's certainly something that is on our mind as we're talking about this particular BRT project that goes from downtown Fort Worth over to Handley. Uh, but that doesn't mean that it can't continue uh, further east into Arlington. And as uh, Councilwoman Gray had mentioned, even uh, off onto uh, Grand Prairie and the city of Dallas. Uh, so there's a huge opportunity here to really um, think big about this BRT project, but also making sure that we think about Fort Worth uh, in the first place, because it is gonna be within the city of Fort Worth. The, the next slide is um, a lot of information. So the next two slides I really have to apologize for because I was trying to cram in a lot of information in a, in a really small slide. And um, when you're sitting, you know, six to eight inches from the screen, it it's pretty easily read, but when you put it on a WebEx, it's a lot harder. So uh, we'll share the presentations afterwards as well so that you can uh, get an up close picture on this. But the highlights in here are really twofold. One is that on the left hand side, there's there's four major transit related goals that we had for the transit moves Fort Worth transit plan um, that um, we recently um, I hate to say completed because it's not quite done yet because we still have draft recommendations, but it was four major transit related goals. We wanted to enhance uh, the system to make it more attractive and compelling for people to um, to use. We wanted to connect people uh, to their life's activities, thrive to improve Fort Worth's quality of life and then sustain and ensure those financial and environmental sustainability across the the uh, city of Fort Worth. The map on the right is a lot going on there. And really, if you focus on those red lines that crisscross the city, those are the BRT lines that we have identified that we would like to try to continue to work on um, over this next 25 years of this, of this transit plan. And you can see there the East Lancaster corridor is one of those lines that we've started to work on. So this is the, the East Lancaster BRT project is the, the transit moves Fort Worth transit plan in action, if you will. The next slide is really the, the six different transit moves that uh, we worked on. And, and I'll just read the, the highlights and not get into the details, but the first one was to develop a high capacity transit services, and that's the BRT. Um, it also includes rapid bus, regional rapid bus, and then uh, obviously commuter rail as well with the, um, the TexRail line and the future extension of TexRail down to the medical district as well. The second transit move is to improve existing services. That's really coming out of the a better connection route redesign that Trinity Metro is doing is to make sure that they improve those existing services that are already out there. There's a lot of good routes that have a have good ridership that will probably and more than likely stay in place. And then there's others that aren't near as productive. And so um, the, the decision is going to have to be made. Do those get pulled? for other services or how do you address the, the low ridership? 
The third transit move is expand transit into new areas. And so there's opportunities um, to review within the city of Fort Worth the expansion into new areas. And then how do we do that? Is that with a fixed route bus? Is that with uh, zip zones that Trinity Metro has been successful with? Uh, what are those opportunities? But it doesn't exclude uh, areas outside of the Trinity Metro service area. It also identifies those opportunities with, uh, with Arlington, um, with Forest Hill, with Crowley, with others as well. So um, um, keeping that in mind. The fourth transit move is improve access to transit. And so I'll show you a couple of items here in a moment with our active transportation plan uh, on how we, we uh, look at that as well. But you can't use the transit system if you can't get there. And a lot of that has to do with the city and improvements of sidewalks uh, and, and bike facilities to get to transit. Number five is improve facilities and amenities. So we know that Trinity Metro has been around since the early 80s and some of the facilities have been around as well and haven't had that uh, that TLC that might be necessary to, to kind of keep updated. And so there's some opportunities there to improve some transit facilities. One of those is along uh, East Lancaster corridor with that East transfer facility. And then ultimately let's make service easier to use. And one of those opportunities is through the new Trinity Metro GoPass app that we'll be rolling out later this year where the city has, has partnered with Trinity Metro to help expand the, the capabilities of smartphone technology so that you can actually purchase all of your trips. If you're gonna use a transit trip and a rail a bus trip, a rail trip, uh, a zip zone, uh, an Uber, and you wanna do all that, uh, you wanna plan all that at one time, you can through the GoPass app and actually pay for it all at once. And so that's a that's going to be a great opportunity for people um, that utilize that technology to uh, access the transit services. Uh, on the next slide, or really the uh, next couple of slides, are really some of the components of the plan that I wanted to highlight because I know that we had talked a lot about it in the the questions, and uh, it's really that walk accessibility to transit. So if you haven't looked at the active transportation plan, um, please do that. That's a, a Fort Worth. Uh, plan that was approved uh, April last year, uh, and you can go to fortworthtexas.gov backslash ATP to really get the, the full treatment of the plan. But you can see here in this small map that's on the, the slide there is what you see there in orange are really the sidewalk gaps near transit within a quarter mile. And so they're good or bad, there's a lot of opportunities for us to really make improvements on the city side to to improve access to transit. And so that includes filling sidewalk gaps, uh, making improvements to sidewalks, and then you know just better pedestrian connections all the way around. Uh, next slide shows, uh, it's still from the active transportation plan, but it's from our bike access improvements of that plan. And so you can see here um, uh, on the Southwest side of, of Fort Worth, there's a lot of opportunities for high priority bike lanes uh, and side path projects. And this too is from our uh, active transportation plan. And so this, this just outlines some of the, the future um, connections that we can make as well. The next slide uh, is complete streets. And so this is something that uh, we want to make sure that as we're redesigning streets or redoing streets, uh, reconstructing them, that um, we wanna make sure that we're looking at them from, from all angles. So it's not just a roadway corridor anymore. It's a, it's a corridor that people can use, bicyclists can use, transit can use, uh, obviously cars can use, uh, but how does everybody get around and, and how do we make it safe if it's not already and keep it safe if it is already? And so there's some opportunities there that you know we'll have that mindset as we're looking at this full corridor on East Lancaster for complete streets as well. Uh, the next slide is really kind of the, you know, the, the good start 
slide that I was mentioning. So future projects, there's a lot going on in the city of Fort Worth uh, and, and in Texas. And so uh, Trinity Metro uh, is working on extension to the Texrail from the TMP station down to the medical district station. So there's opportunities there to further that connection to transit. Obviously the East Lancaster BRT project that we've been talking about here today, uh, and then potential for that extension into Arlington. So that's certainly something that's on the table, uh, but um, I think the, the the leadership in Arlington, they just need to be brought up to speed a little bit more on how it can benefit them if they connect into this particular BRT system. But we don't wanna necessarily wait for them uh, to get on board. We wanna a, a plan for their eventuality uh, so that we can continue on our schedule of development. Uh, if you haven't heard already, there's high speed rail um, between Dallas and Houston that got federal approval, which means that they can start construction early next year on high speed rail, which is amazing, I think, for Texas and, uh, and North Texas as well. Um, which means that, all right, once you get that in place, uh, where does it go once it reaches Houston? Uh, sorry, once it reaches Dallas, uh, it, the logical next step is that it needs to come through Arlington into Fort Worth and then out again to the rest of the region, which means that there's opportunities for Fort Worth to be connected to yeah. Waco, oh, to Austin, San Antonio, and even all the way down to Laredo at some point as well. So, uh, a lot going on there, a lot of information in a short time. If you go to the last slide, there is a, um, a link uh, that's identified there for the Transit Moves Fort Worth slide uh, website. Uh, I think it's already well, posted like in the yet. chat as well, uh, at least temporarily. Um, but I want to make I sure that we might just um, do now since he's gotten through most of his future projects. You guys uh, on, have the opportunity uh, to look at the, the transit moves Fort Worth like to do that. page but, as well. Uh, Ruth, why don't we move along to the um, to the next presentation slide? There it is. Oh, there, you there? That was quick. <laughs> okay. But it is posted in the, the chat window as well. It is transitmovesfortworth.com. So, um, and then I think, um, are there any questions? Uh, I think, uh, does Mike? Hey Chad. hey, Chad, this is Corey Beck. I have a couple of questions that I wrote down from the chat box. Um, that may be for you. I'm not really sure, though. Shoot, I'll try to answer them. All right. So, first, up, we have some design questions. So, I don't know if maybe um, yourself or maybe Trinity Metro wants to jump in for design questions. Um, but uh, Pamela would like to know what the number of car lanes there will be for um, for each side if we were to do a link, the bus rapid line in the middle of the street. So our early, and Trinity Metro can chime in if they want to, but our early thought process uh, is that um, there on the the. East end of the corridor, there's six lanes and a very wide median. And so the idea is that uh, we can utilize um, one of those, uh, two of those lanes um, and the median for the BRT. And so we would reduce from six lanes to four lanes that corridor. Uh, there's still some design discussions that have to be um, made and uh, but that's kind of the early thought is that we would reduce those number of lanes. There's a lot of capacity out there uh, along East Lancaster uh, that, you know, that all those cars that used to use East Lancaster have really moved to a, a different corridor on I-30. And so um, uh, mm -hmm. if we reduce the number of lanes to four, uh, we don't think it should be a, a, an issue. Next. Um, then also we have Dan asked 
Will, would the street be rebuilt um, or is it using like the existing um, structure that we have? I think that's yet to be determined at this point is what, how much of a reconstruction is it? Um, I think we need to do our, our due diligence on that to, to figure out what the, the cost estimate is for a full blown right away to right away reconstruction. What, what is that cost? Um, it may be outside of the budget that we have, um, but that doesn't mean that there can't be some um, locations along the way that get some of that treatment. We're still early on in the process. So these are really good questions for us to hear now so that we can answer those, uh, make sure we answer those in the future. Um, and then also, oh, sorry. Uh, we just had a question from Mike Weiss. I do have to unmute him in order for him to ask me a question. Will that be okay at this time? Mike, can you hear us? Oh, let me let me unmute him. Okay. Okay. We should be able to speak now. Okay. Go ahead, Mike. Oh yeah, most of them know me and to me I'm people with disabilities. I have patients, but each a punch for them in talking uh, how I don't clean that I heard how are we gonna clean it up? What what part of that like? Well basically security we got it. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, that that's a big consideration along the corridor is is um, security and, and safety. Um, and again, it's still early on the process for us to to put too fine a detail on it. But um we'll, we're going to keep that in our mind as we're working on the project on how to address those okay my last question chad you go talking about go pack will that include access Will it include, you're talking about the go pass and yeah. will it include, you said access, is that for, um, for a um, disabled um, yes. vehicle, yes. handicap accessible? Yes. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So with um, currently with the, the VIA app in the uh, zip zones, there is a button that you can push that identifies if you need, uh, say, a wheelchair accessible. I, I know that, but I'm talking about paragenetics. Go past. If I want to make the vibe on access to come to my door, will that be on the go pass? Oh, I see what you're asking. So you, if I understand right, you're asking about the, the access part of Trinity Metro, and is that gonna be included in the go pass app? Yes, sir. That, oh, okay. So that's a question I'm gonna pass over to Trinity Metro because I'm not for certain on that. Uh, if, if anybody from Trinity Metro can help me with that. Kieran, uh, yeah. like, uh, Chad, get in here. Uh, can, uh, can you repeat the question, please? 
So um, Mr. Weiss is asking about in the GoPass app, will the, the access part of your uh, services be included in the GoPass app? Well, um, at this time it is not included, but the feature, the basically the app is continuously evolving. It is uh, still uh, in the developing stage. So in the future, uh, definitely that feature will be in um, will be added. So is that yes in the future it will be added. Sorry, Mike, can you repeat that? He was just saying that he was confirming, yes, in the future it will be added, is his understanding of what the answer was. In the future, that feature, yes. Two years, five years down the road. Does anybody have a timeline of when the future? Two years, five years? That was his question. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, at this time, uh, we uh, we don't have a timeline for that feature. Uh, but we include that feature in the backlog basically means uh, once we have uh, the features that we need to develop immediately, once they are done, uh, then we will uh, take this for the development in the app. So that that would be a helpful feature in the the GoPass app for you, then Mike. Right. Yeah. And Mike, this is Jeremy. Yes. If you ever have any questions or concerns, you're always able to contact me. I'm here for you. All right. Thank you all for your time. No, Thanks no, for you're participating, good. Mike. I was also going to ask this question about security. I, I'm sure anybody else could chime in on this as well. But the types of stops that are incorporated into bus rapid transit are, you know, more well lit. They have cover from weather and all of that um, and then the activity that's brought to a street that has something a, a transit service such as this brings more people to the street and therefore more eyes on the street and i can see nothing but the security along that area or the safety along that area the activity the the um people feeling safer being out on that street will just continue to get better with the type of activity that's brought by transit oriented development and by bus rapid transit. So, so really quick, I'm going to jump in here because security is a great conversation. Dan Hayes is going to talk about it when he talks about the East Lancaster PID. So let's not spend a lot of time there. And we want to be cognizant of everybody's time. Um, so it's 4.53. We said this was going to be over at 5. I don't think that's what we're going to hit. But if we could keep moving, that would be great. And Dan, Dan will wrap up that piece on the security part for us. Okay, well said, uh, Kelly, and Ann. That's uh, that's good, good additions. Uh, Wanda, you're up. If you're ready to go, give us uh, give us the the lowdown on uh, Vision East Lancaster. All right, I will be brief because we are running out of time. I had two pages that I had written down and I was going to deliver those in five minutes. So I will forget that and I'm just going to fly. Um, our Vision East Lancaster is a task force 
parented by East Fort Worth Business Association. Uh, the strength that the East Fort Worth Business Association brings to the East Lancaster Corridor is our ability to coalesce business leaders, uh, neighborhood leaders, uh, residents, all to, we, we're able to help bring them together in a, uh, uh, an effort to make all of East Fort Worth better. Uh, when we came away from the economic development uh, exercise that Danny did in uh, 2012, he had broken us up into five different um, areas of interest. Uh, East Fort Worth Business Association took um, the hard, what we considered the hardest one was East Lancaster because it has uh, some particular challenges that are indigenous to that particular area. Seven miles long, we are cut off by the homeless uh, shelters between us and downtown. So that it presented some challenges that other, maybe the other commercial corridors didn't have. Um, we started with uh, just a, a small group, but we had with us a um, professor from UTA uh, an urban uh, um, an urban he's a, a geographer an urban geographer and he took his students and he put together a survey a very extensive survey and he also uh, used those students to do an inventory a broad inventory of all the parcels along there and all of their um, owners. Uh, the survey was taken by a large number of East Fort Worth people. We were not surprised at what they considered, what they wanted, and what they considered the problems were. Uh, the problems being that uh, East Lancaster is a highway, a, a, a wonderful historic uh, part of Fort Worth that um, has all of the auto related usage. Well, uh, they're there because it's a highway, motels, auto repair places, all of those are they're there. They considered that a uh, barrier and it and it really is. It's hard to uh, compete with those usage that are, are uh, historically there. Then uh, the other thing that they felt like was the biggest barrier was the homeless population. Well, Don and I, my wonderful husband and I, immersed ourselves in trying to learn what that real problem was. He took on the task of an interim chairmanship of a um, of the homeless commission. It wasn't a commission; it was a committee. More, more than it was a task force actually during that period of time, and we learned that uh, what we really have a problem with are not the homeless who want to uh, get out of homelessness real quick. They take all the services that are available to them and they don't stay long. What we're dealing with were vagrants that wouldn't accept the help, that were lying in front of the businesses' doorways, like sleeping on the sidewalk, uh, defecating and urinating in uh, unspeakable ways to prevent people from actually uh, enjoying the businesses that we did have. Uh, we got help with that. We asked for help from our police department and we got that help. Uh, the neighborhood police officer that we got gathered a, a task force of his own and he started visiting the homeless camps, the people who were just camping out on the street. And he was taking uh, the people who could help them and giving them the resources that they needed and telling them where they needed to go. Otherwise, hey, fellas, you need to move along because you cannot be camping out, doing all of, leaving all of this trash here on private property. We got that help from our police department. And it has really made a difference along the corridor. The other uh, barrier that we had 
and still have is a perception of high crime along that quarter. This is a perception. It is not a fact. It is not a fact. And East Fort Worth citizens need to stop shooting themselves in the foot. All of you are here because you want to help East Lancaster. And one of the things we need to do is start talking about the good things that are along East Lancaster and not keep saying how bad it is. It If it were as bad as their perception is, I wouldn't live here. Neither would most of the other people who live here and the new people who are coming here because it is a good place to be. Um, Kelly is a wonderful asset for us. She has been a part of our task force from the very beginning. And she and I had made a little trip over to uh, COG, to North Texas uh, Council of Governments, to meet with Michael Morris. And we went thinking, well, we're just going to ask for anything we can get. And he was so encouraging with us. And I have to tell you that he is one of our biggest supporters. He's going to do everything he can to help us. He told us that there's a $50 million allocation for East Lancaster improvements. Well, an allocation and an appropriation are two different things. We won't get $50 million until there's $50 million to get. And, 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 and trying to rush through this, we, we've had some successes. We've had some other things that we put on the back burner thinking that sooner or later they'll come along, and they will. But one of our biggest, uh, biggest things that we've done is we've replaced all that lighting along there. I don't know if you all can remember how dingy and awful it looked. You couldn't see anything. Well, Bill Swenson had been one of our members had been working on those lights for 30 years trying to get something done. And we, we managed to get the light poles painted so they didn't look all rusty and awful anymore. And we got LEDs on the, along that whole seven mile stretch. We have wonderful lighting now. The other wonderful thing that we got was that library. And I think it's gonna really make a difference. Thank you. Thank you, Wanda. That was a good summary of, uh, of the activities of uh, uh, Vision East Lancaster. Uh, let's move on now to uh, Dan Hass and the Public Improvement District to find out more about the security efforts that are underway. You're breaking up a bit, um, but, but try to try to get through it, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll let you know if you if you disappear. Dan, you dropped them up. Uh, you, you keep breaking up. You keep breaking up. Yeah, call on the phone. And I sent you an additional email um, with other instructions in case you heard me before you walked away. Eric, did you want to move on to the other parts of the presentation until we get Dan back? Uh, yeah, I think that'd be a good idea. So why don't we do this? Um, why don't we just hop on to the, the questions um, and that I think we've got in a chat form. Oh, wait a minute. Let's just see if Dan's on. 
Can you hear us, Dan? Okay, Dan, we're gonna we're gonna move on, and uh, you can try to work on that phone connection and see if that'll work. And uh, maybe um, maybe Ruth and Catherine can provide some instructions for that. Um, and if we don't get to you this meeting, I'm gonna talk a little bit more later about the next meeting, and we'll get, make sure that you're involved in that one as well. Um, so. So what we've got on the on the polling side of your screen there is uh, is is three different questions, and we'd like you to uh, go through those questions and answer them uh, with uh, with really kind of what are what are those gut things or the things that you you like most about East Lancaster? We heard a little bit about uh, from Wanda about that. Uh, what do you like least about East Lancaster? And Wanda shared some of that as well. Uh, and then uh, what would you like to change about the East Lancaster corridor? So if you could just start typing in your responses to that in the polling box. And we're going to give you just a few minutes to complete that task. I also placed the link for a survey monkey um, for the same poll questions. If you don't have time to finish it and it closes out on you, I'll forward the results to Eric.
How are we doing, Ruth? Are we ready to move on? Yeah, sorry, I was on mute, but you should be able to see some of the results now. Is that right? Not yet. And I can just read some of these off um, under, what do you like? Or Eric, if you'd like, we can just go ahead and move forward so that we can get to the, to the rest of it and she can try to post it when it pulls up. Let's do that. Um, and if it doesn't, pull up uh, by the time we're ready to leave, then we can just provide that later. Uh, Dan is going to be providing the PID information as well later. So let's go ahead and move on to the next. Can you switch the uh, screen? There we go. Okay, so the next piece is, um, is we wanted to share with you some maps of the corridor with a variety of detailed information. We're not going to spend much time going through this. Corey Beck will share a little bit of information, but we're going to produce these as a as a map set, uh, and we're going to add it at the end of a survey monkey that we're going to be sending out. You'll be able to click a button and get these maps downloaded to your computer. Corey, hi everybody. So um, we looked at the corridor and can see on these maps the full line. Corey, can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? No. No, not well. Corey, tell you what, I'll just, uh, I'll walk through these slides and Ruth can advance them. Um, so the first one that you're looking at is just the location map. So the yellow lines that you see are actually the boundaries of the council districts with the council, council district labels on. Uh, this is generally just a, an aerial photo. Uh, we had questions about the upper distances. The first flat dotted line you see is a quarter mile from the street. The next one is a half mile. We use this in planning to, uh, to look at existing conditions, look at opportunities and identify uh, things that that might be addressed through the plans. Uh, next map. Uh, this is an existing land use map that shows basically what uh, is actually on the ground. And you can see that the, the pie charts indicate the percentages of each. Next map. So this is the same corridor, the same buffers. This is future land use. So this is the city's adopted future land use plan. Uh, it identifies the kinds of uses that are intended to exist. Um, and you can see the different colors represent different kinds of uses along the corridor. Uh, when you receive this, you'll see it in, in larger format. It'll be easier to see. And if we ever get to um, in-person meetings, you'll, you'll get to see very large versions of them. Uh, but this is the city's plan. So next screen. Okay, so this download for some reason. Okay, well the um, it, they seem to be they seem to be coming down. This is uh, we've been talking about transportation uh, all afternoon, and this map represents the active transportation plan. That the city has adopted. So, uh, bicycle facilities, uh, pedestrian facilities, both on street and off street, are represented on this map. Next map. 
Uh, this is the uh, same corridor. Uh, we're looking here at the floodplain. So the blue ha crosshatch that you see are uh, designated floodplain areas. Uh, the red color that you see are vacant parcels. Uh, so this is another means of identifying opportunities for new development to occur you know, along the corridor. Next. Uh, this is uh, the PID uh, map. Uh, so this is all of the properties that are members of the Public Improvement District. Dan uh, might have shared this uh, with you as well, but we'll make sure that you do get this. Next. Those are all. Let me see if I can go back to four. Okay, yeah, you can actually move on to the, the next screen because they'll be getting that. Okay, so uh, just to finish up with next steps before Councilmember Rubivens uh, joins us to, to share some words. Um, first off, um, we've got good participation, but we can always use more if you let other folks that are property owners, particularly, uh, or otherwise stakeholders on the East Lancaster Corridor know about this planning effort. Uh, we'd love to get them connected and have them engaged in future meetings. Uh, Start thinking about where along the corridor you would like to see bus rapid transit stations as well as trans-oriented development. Um, so those are those will be specific locations where we can have uh, sort of the, the, the more enhanced tra transit stations uh, on the bus rapid transit system as well as the type of development, the walkable pedestrian oriented, somewhat higher density, but mix of uses that would be um, compatible with being around those stations. And then lastly, uh, be on the lookout for another WebEx invitation for November. So we're going to set something up for uh, the middle of November probably, um, and we'll get more into a uh, discussion of sort of the, the land use impacts and the opportunities for improvements along the corridor. Next. Okay, uh, Council Member Bivens, um, we'd like to hear what you have to say now. I can say it in 90 seconds, Eric, and thank you and forgive me for being late, but I will tell you nearly two decades ago, Paul Geisel, Greg Hughes, John Bartosowicz and I went to Canada and we saw how public transportation done right could move people efficiently. A few years later, we went to Oregon to look at TOD and we were told that if you build it, you will see development come 15 miles on either side. The catch was if it was done right. And when you hear Chairman Davis talk about 15 minute headways, that's doing it right because people will know that they don't have to get there and wait forever to get to their desired location. What I would tell you that makes me feel so proud is we on the T-board at the time, that's my bus stop sign back there. We were just shocked to learn that DART had the knowledge and bought the cotton belt. We were really offended. And so for us to have the first BRT in the region is ample payback to, to my friends at DART. And the last thing I will tell you is if you haven't heard enough about transportation, uh, you can take a few minutes, get a sandwich and at six o'clock, log on to the COGS website because the North Central Texas Council of Governments is conducting a high speed rail study and alignments and they want your input. I was a part of that yesterday. It's gonna happen at six o'clock. Just go to the COGS website. I think you will be delighted if you are a transit junkie and I hope that's 90 seconds. Thank you and hats off to Vision East Lancaster. You guys rock. Bye. All right, very well said. And uh, and I will certainly reiterate that you have the opportunity to get on uh, the NCT COG website and, and join in that high-speed rail conversation. That, that would be very helpful. Uh, and I'm sure Chad would echo that as well, and and uh, uh, all the council members would. Uh, that's all we have for you today. As I said, uh, look forward to another opportunity in November. Uh, really want to thank uh, each of the council members for taking the time to join us. Uh, their schedules are extremely busy. Um, and want to thank everybody who's participated, both the speakers and the folks that are just uh, listening in on the on the meeting. Um, thank you very much. Uh, hope you've learned something. We will be sending out information and, and definitely be on the lookout for the survey monkey that will allow you to uh, access those maps as well as share more information 
about what your aspirations are for these Lancaster corridor. Thank you so much, everyone. And the survey will open right after this WebEx is done. So right after your exit, you can fill up the survey. Excellent. Okay, Eric, I sent you a list of all of the attendees.